Praise God. It's so good to be together again. We've had some great worship, a great talk on giving. Thank you, Pam. And now let's indulge in the word of God. You know, I don't know what kind of week that you've had, but Psalm 34 says this, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, the Lord delivers us out of them all. Isn't that a great promise? So let's just welcome the precious Holy Spirit to help you and I to focus more on God's promises right now. Precious Holy Spirit, we need you. We always need you. We just ask you to breathe upon the Word of God, make it find its mark in our heart. And Lord, we ask that you would transform our lives. We know that we are renewed in our minds by the transformational power of the living Word of God. And you prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we believe we receive your breath igniting with the Word of God right now, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're talking about There's a Fire, and we're on There's a Fire Part 3. Wasn't that so good? Part 2, talking about There's a Fire. And we indulge, we kind of drilled down on Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Listen to this. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Do you remember that? He was led by the Spirit. Remember in the previous chapter, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at the Jordan when John the Baptist baptized our Lord and Savior Jesus. Jesus said to John, John didn't even want to do it. Jesus said, John, suffer it to be so. See, Jesus had to obey. He had to submit to God's times and season. And Jesus didn't even get to get Jesus' results, the results that we're used to, until he was filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized with that precious fire. God intentionally withheld the outcome of the anointing fire until the climax of the ages. That's what Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 talk about. It's air, God's love, plus the fuel, God's word, plus the heat, God's precious Holy Spirit equals fire. Spiritual pyrolysis, if you will. There's, there are problems in life that often, that often seem intractable, unmovable, rigidly and chronically stuck. Have you ever been there? Like if you've ever lived in a cold place and woke up with this thick layer of ice all over your car window or three feet of heavy, wet snow in your driveway, it seems intractable. That's the word. That is until this big ball of fire in the sky comes out and we all get to see the sun. The sun comes out, the sky goes blue, the temperature rises and rises and suddenly that ice that you could hardly pound or scrape, you couldn't move off your window, it just melts off effortlessly, right? The snow that you could barely shovel, it becomes so, it's so deep and heavy, it starts shrinking and bowing in submission to the power of the sun. My friend, there's a fire, a fire of God's favor melting the intractable obstructions in your life and making what is humanly impossible otherwise suddenly easy, making what's heavy light, making what's broken healed and what's harder than steel as soft and malleable as melted wax. You see, that's what God's fire can do in our life. There's a reason why things are hard and then why suddenly they become easy. You and I can't live without God's fire. We were designed for it. We were designed and Jesus told us himself, he told his disciples, he said, it will be so profitable for you when the Holy Spirit comes because he's the comforter and he will lead you into all truth, right? That's how the comforter comforts us. He initiates movement, life, heat, and there is fire. If you've got an iceberg-sized problem, I mean a, a, an iceberg mountain of a problem or an obstruction, you're in the right place right now, downloading the right mystery from God's precious Word. So get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. You need to know something up front now. The baptism that Jesus ministers in the Holy Spirit will completely and radically change your thinking. 
It's not religious thinking, what I'm talking about here. In fact, having the Holy Spirit steer your thinking and control your thinking, listen to this, it's anti-religious thinking. It's anti-old, traditional, broke down, it never works, but we'll do it anyway thinking. Oh yeah, so get excited about that. The Holy Spirit is the expert on thinking outside of every box of tired, broke down dysfunction. Albert Einstein once said this. He said, imagination is more important than knowledge. But you know what? Ungodly thinking prefers bondage. Carnal, traditional thinking despises freedom. So you have to understand that. The problem is we as humans tend to like our boxes and our traditions. Even though they fail and they lull us into this false sense of security with a placebo type panacea, at least this way we can embrace our ignorance of God's real will and substitute our feel good philosophy of my truth. Have you ever heard people talk about, oh, well, it's my truth in place of God's truth? Whew. And then just change the channel to suit our confirmation bias. It's not a good thing. My friend, confirmation as you're running off a cliff in the dark may seem friendly. It may seem friendly in the moment, but you and I both know that it's a death sentence. Telling someone with a couple of 100% blocked arteries that they can eat whatever they want as long as they say grace over it, that's not kind and that's not loving. And I hope you understand that. It's religious. It's not kind, it's religious. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit empowers us to overcome. Who? How? Overcome what? Our old way of thinking, our traditional thinking, our bad habit thinking. He lights up the danger so that we stop, we repent. Don't forget this. Cultural thinking is usually stupid thinking, and it's always been that way. 100 years ago, popular thinking was, of course, human beings will never fly to the moon. Who's, who's saying stupid things like that? See, popular thinking is not good thinking, and it never will be good thinking. Good thinking is unusual. A man by the name of John Menard Keynes, who dramatically influenced economies of our world and the nations, said this, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from the old ones. This was a, a man very astute and intelligent in the things of finance. And he said, even in finance, we have a hard time letting go of our old ideas. Jesus, living with his disciples, could not change their thinking from popular to good. Remember Peter? He didn't want Jesus to go to the cross. Can you imagine if Jesus didn't go to the cross for us? Wow. James and John, remember them, the two disciples? They wanted to call fire down on the people and consume the people. That's not God's plan. <laughs> that wasn't God's goodness. God, Jesus had to even rebuke his two disciples in that area. See, this is all with Jesus standing right beside them. They needed an infilling, a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus standing right beside them wasn't enough. They needed the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. So in parts one and two, we learn this. Fire is that chemical reaction called pyrolysis. We get a chemical triangle. Remember that? Oxygen plus the fuel, we use steel wool, plus the heat and the movement, we used a battery, produce fire. Oxygen, fuel, heat produces fire. Well, it's the same thing with the Holy Trinity. God is love, God is the Word, and God the precious Holy Spirit, that movement produces supernatural spiritual fire. Matthew 3, verse 11, we talked about that. John the Baptist prophesied about Jesus, and he said this about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And we learned that that fire produces illumination. It produces elimination. It produces amalgamation, detonation, agitation and celebration, all good things that we desperately need in our life. God plus the Word plus His Holy Spirit equals that spiritual fire that lights up our life for goodness, for blessing. We're called to be the light of the world in Christ Jesus. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire produces amalgamation. In part three, let's drill down on that word amalgamation. 
Why does that matter to you? Why does amalgamation matter to us? Spiritual amalgamation. Great question. And you should be asking great questions like this. See, have you ever had some homemade biscuits or pancakes to eat and they were just super delicious? Have you ever driven or flown in a vehicle made out of something other than wood? Have you ever listened to music? Music with more than just one instrument playing. Have you? I'm pretty sure you have. Well, then you have indulged in the fine art of amalgamation. When you take some flour, some baking powder, a little salt, some butter and milk, combine it all with the right heat and fire, you know what you get? You get some homemade amalgamation to go along with your tea or coffee. That's the recipe for biscuits. Oh yeah, three cheers for amalgamation. But once again, it's the product and the outcome of fire. You've got to have that heat. You've got to have that movement. You've got to have that movement of the molecules, even at an atomic level. So let's get a little bit Hebrew for just a few minutes, okay? Because there's some secrets for us in the Hebrew language. Fire in Hebrew is announced ish. It's two Hebrew letters that mean the strong devourer. But when you take those two Hebrew letters for fire and add one more letter that means person, you get the word picture, fire upon the head of a person, which translates into this English word, blessed, happy. Oh, did you get that? The fire part of God energizes and fuels blessing and happiness. The Hebrew word ashar means blessed, success, happiness. From the word picture, the fire of the prince. Isn't that amazing? We need the word fire to get blessing into our life. Now follow me on, on a verse here that is often misunderstood and mistaken as a curse instead of a blessing. I want you to hear this. Proverbs 25 verses 21 and 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Verse 22. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, I remember as a boy when I read that, I thought, well, I guess that means by doing that, we're somehow burning the head off our enemy. It seemed like a pretty serious, uh, a pretty and serious judgment on our enemies. But you see, it's not talking about setting your enemy on fire, but instead blessing your enemy. Instead of cursing him, you're blessing him. Heaping coals on someone's head was a metaphor for providing fire for their basic needs. In most places in the world, people understand that concept. To be without fire is to be without warmth in the freezing cold, to be without protection, to be without safe food or sterile water. Fire means life. So that verse was all about heaping a blessing upon your enemy. The fire of God is our source of blessing, happiness, joy, comfort, illumination, and direction. But the fire is threefold. It really is the manifestation of the Trinity, the Godhead, Father, Son, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. It produces, He produces fire. That's why we know from Hebrews 12 that God is a consuming fire. Just imagine the disciples in the upper room waiting for Jesus' promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had God's love. They had air everywhere. They had God's promise, God's word. They had Jesus' word. Then the third part, the movement came, the Holy Spirit's heat. And in Acts 2, what appears to be tongues of fire. It produced supernatural fire. Manufacturers use the amalgamating power of fire to create amazing alloys of steel and in turn are used to make safe bridges, buildings for people, planes and cars that safely move families. See, only the predators and the ignorant are afraid of fire. They don't get the biscuits, <laughs> so to speak. So let's zone in on this amalgamation virtue of God's fire. I love this picture. To amalgamate means to unite or to merge into a single body. Imagine making, imagine making steel with me, okay? To make steel, you must melt elements like iron ore and carbon into one new alloy. Now, the interesting thing is these elements cease to be what they are, and they become something far greater. The sum is truly greater than the whole of its parts. You've heard that before. 
The steel produced is harder, it's stronger, yet it's more flexible. It becomes non-corrosive in its quality. Talk about an amazing picture of unity. You see, we have a world that's crying for unity, but they don't have the fire of God. Yes, amalgamation is the genius of cohesion. I'll say it again. God does not desire destructive fire for your life. His plan is to save you. That's why he sent Jesus. God does, however, want to remove the toxins and the dross from our lives. And that requires fire. God does want to heal our wounds. Spiritual cauterization, if you will. That requires laser precision fire. God does want to bring unity, peace, cohesion, profitability to your life. Guess what? Yeah, you, you, you're getting the answer now. You need his fire. I need his fire. God's fire works even in our thought life. Follow me on this. Now, we're going to get a little scientific, but you're going to like this. Epigenetics is the relatively new science that gives credible study to how our thoughts and our decisions affect our brain, our genes, and our DNA. Basically, neurons in your brain rely on signals, you get that, and electrical impulses, little fires, to either create epigenetic markers on your genes for calm, happiness, peace, good health, or we can switch to anxiety, negativity, fear, worry, and so on. Did you get that? We switch on or off with these little fires by triggering, firing a signal on a neuron. For example, we can have a bad memory concerning a person and choose not to forgive them. And so we keep resending and resending and refiring and resenting. Remember, we talked about bad fire, unholy fire that's not from God. And now that resentment amplifies the bad memory and then emotions follow thinking. Let me say that again. Emotions follow your thinking. So you have anger, anxiety, sadness depression. You've just used neuroplasticity to fire chemical reactions in your brain and reinforce a trauma that affects your heart rate. Now your physical body's involved. Your breathing elevates. Your blood pressure goes up and deepens the frown wrinkles even in your face. Your thoughts are producing matter. But it works amazingly in the opposite direction too. Here's the good stuff. You can take God's truth, meditate on it. It becomes a fire. It welcomes the movement of the Holy Spirit in your thinking. And suddenly traumatic, toxic, sad, discouraging thoughts are replaced with the new epigenetic markers kindled by God's fire. Oh, God's fire is intelligent fire. Do you hear what I said? His fire is intelligent fire. Even at an atomic level, this fire of God consumes all the joy stealers in your life, in your memory. And instead, it fires impulses on your neurons for overcoming happy, focused, beautiful, peaceful mental constructs. Man, that's good. Did you know, did you know this? More electrical impulses are generated in one day by a human brain than by all the cell phones in the world. Isn't that amazing? You are fearfully and wonderfully made, my friend, but made for God's fire. Make no mistake about it. And God has provided a built-in pharmacy in your brain so that as his fire triggers um, in your brain, those natural chemicals like oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, they help to enforce the good connections and at the same time desynchronize negative, bad patterns your billions of neurons were creating. Like I said, feelings follow thoughts. If you don't like your feelings, change your thoughts. How? With fire. You've got to trigger with those signals, the right decisions, the right markers with God's word. Let me just double down and enforce that. Ephesians 4 verse 23. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. How? With God's intelligent fire. You have the right to decide what thoughts you accept and what thoughts you reject. You have the right and the authority to decide to apply the fire of God to each and every thought, determining if it's part of your steel or just chaff to be burned up. This fire of God is your choice. It's up to you. 
So let's enlarge the canvas and let me give you another example of amalgamation, something that a lot of people are familiar with, marriage, true love. Dr. Frank Seekins, a friend of mine, is a Hebrew scholar, a Bible teacher, and a marriage counselor from Scottsdale, Arizona, who expertly uses Hebrew foundations, and he does it so well. Usually, when I refer to a Hebrew word, I'm pulling from his resources. He's been such a blessing in my life. We've already learned that bless is the word ashar, meaning what comes from the fire of the prince. Ashar, bless, happiness, success, uprightness, leading straight. That's a fire of hope, isn't it? Now, this gets really exciting as we carry this Hebrew word for fire into the thought of forging and amalgamation. Have you ever longed for more unity in your marriage, your relationships? Have you ever wondered why the fire in your relationship is more of a hell kind of fire and less of a heaven kind of fire? I'm being serious. Remember what I said, fire in context is a wonderful, inviting, beautiful thing. Fire out of context is painful, it's scary. If you take the two Hebrew letters for fire and you put the letter yud, meaning hand extended, in the middle of the word for fire, you get the word for man, the word for husband. Now, if you take the two Hebrew letters for fire and put the letter he on the end, meaning what comes from, you mysteriously get the word for woman, wife. Okay, so follow me here. So you need fire to make a man or to make a woman, to make a husband or to make a wife. You have to have fire in there. But now let's talk about the amalgamation part of this, the alloy, because this is the highly profitable steel that God calls marriage, not the world's fake version that makes all the divorce lawyers rich. You're about to see why you cannot slap the word marriage on any union and think that you're going to have what God defines as Good. Remember Genesis 2, verse 18? Now the Lord God said, It is not good, beneficial, for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, suitable, adapted, complementary for him. See, everything that God has made, He said was good. Everything God made, He said, and it was good. It's the first time God said something wasn't good that He made. See, He was in process of making a God-type alloy. He was still in the process. And a side note here, God was not saying that being single is not good or a blessing. Paul the Apostle cleared that up in 1 Corinthians 7. You can read that after. Father God is starting a family here in this situation, and He needs to make some steel to get the building started, right? So the word for man has fire in it. The word for woman has fire in it. But when you take those two different letters in man and woman and put them together, you get the name Yah, God's name. True marriage reveals God's character, God's goodness, and God's fire. Marriage done right, my friend, with God in the center reveals His glory, His character, and all of His promises that He obligates Himself to on behalf of a man and a woman, a marriage. But if you remove those differences, if you remove God from marriage, from that union, you are left with fire times fire, which as Dr. Seekins explains, is the worst fire on earth. It is hell on earth. My friend, we have a crisis on planet earth and it's evident. You don't have to look too far to see man's systems are failing. We have a lot of out of control fires burning that don't have God in them. We have weird fire, strange fire, unholy fire, and the system is falling in on humanity. So then we do what the enemy has strategized. We outlaw fire in our hearts and we call it hell, trying to say that this is God's doing and making anything authentic of blessing is all about religion. Don't take the bait. Do not be deceived, my friend. Yes, God is a consuming fire, as Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, but not to your detriment, but for your salvation. <laughs> Only God has the power of holy fire to make our unity true, pure, and beneficial. Hollywood spends billions of dollars schooling us on love and yet fail at marriage over and over and over. Politicians, they lecture us on unity, and yet it seems utterly hopeless and helpless for them to solve the rioting and the lawlessness. Elitist educators, they look down their nose on society 
and they choose to program your children to be divided, confused, and entitled because in their hearts, they're divided, confused, and entitled. My friends, we need desperately the baptism of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit and fire. It's a good thing. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Three practical steps I want to give you that you can engage to receive this amazing baptism of the Lord's. Number one, be real. Number two, be still. And number three, be filled. Number one, be real. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be deceived. Be honest. It requires humility. Number two, be still. Psalm 46, verse 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. Acts 1, verse 4, Jesus said, wait for the promise. And then the third point, be filled. Ephesians 5, 18 says, be filled with the Spirit of God. Luke 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost. Oh, He modeled it for us. So number one, when we're talking about being real, listen to this. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. You see, but we've all sinned. We all need saving because we've all sinned needing Jesus. We're all sick needing the healthy hand of Dr. Jesus. Jesus is saying, I can only help you if you're honest and if you ask me for that help. So be real. Can you just imagine going to a doctor and you have a blistering, painful rash all over your face and he says, well, we need to get you, we need to help get rid of that rash. And you're like, oh, no, no, I like the rash. It makes me look young again. I just want you to help me to get it all over the rest of my body. He can't help you because even if he has the antidote, your real problem is you're thinking, you're deceived, you're not being real. You cannot fill a broken vessel. How can you fill a cup or a pot with no bottom or broken sides? You and I need repair. We need healing, fixing, a supernatural fire to reshape and remold our vessel. Be real, my friend, or your broken will just stay broken. And number two, you got to be still. Be, being still is not sleeping or napping on your knees. It's sustained focus. It's refusing to get out of line because you expect God to do what he said he's going to do. It's being the vessel that God is about to fill and standing still so that he can fill you, postured to receive because you believe. Waiting on the Lord patiently, expectantly with sustained focus. Yes, that means prayer, but I'm almost hesitant to use that word because we've so butchered it with our religious assumptions. Prayer without humility, step one, is useless. Prayer without honesty is dangerous, step one. Ephesians 6, verse 18, prayer always with, praying with all prayer, the apostle advised us to do. This word originates from the Greek meaning intimate contact with desire and vows. This is the authentic type of prayer that God asked for in Psalm 46, verse 10, where he says, be still and know that I'm God. You're intensely focused on God. This should be a sincere act of surrender that seals the deal. And you began in step number one, be still. Number three, we move on to be filled. You have to welcome Jesus' baptism. You have to want his movement, his heat, this power from God. Psalm 37 verse four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But as I told you earlier, the enemy works overtime to deceive us into wrong thinking and negative thinking about God's precious Holy Spirit. God won't give you something and that you refuse or are not in faith for. The disciples had to wait expectantly if you've ever stood in line to get into a concert or to get into a special event or even to a, one of those blowout sales, right, with 90% off, but you have to think twice about wanting to be filled with his precious gift that is a guarantee of our inheritance in Christ Jesus for our life, uh, don't worry about it. You're still at step number one. You need to focus on being real. But as you do this and practice this order of one, two, three, you'll develop spiritual muscle memory. It's not a one-time thing. This is, this is how we continually grow. Oh, but Pastor Stephen, I'm, I'm, I'm still at step number one, being real. That's not a problem. Let Holy Spirit help you. You might even be saying, I've, dr I've been dropped. I've been so hurt, so abused. I'm such a mess. I've failed over and over. Is that you? Are you that broken cup, that shattered vessel that knows you need Jesus? the Savior, to piece your life together miraculously? 
to make what's dead and broken new and restored? Did you notice that each step, one, two, and three, is a new level of surrender? It's a progression of surrender. You can activate the essential of step number one right now by being real and asking Jesus into your life. Pray this with me. Inviting Jesus into your heart. Only you have the authority to welcome the Savior, the Savior and the baptizer Jesus into your life. He alone is the way to God's deliverance and freedom. Pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Repair the brokenness of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave. You've set me free. I'm a child of God in your name, Jesus. Now, stay in that attitude of prayer. Now, if you desire to have Jesus baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, just pray this along with me again. Jesus, you've saved me. You've made me a child of God. Now baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Ignite me with fire for life. Help me to burn bright for you. Anoint me to do good. Empower me to live like you. To your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.